Thank you very much, Ms. Maeda. Everyone, uh, I hope you had a great morning and lunch. Thanks very much for spending some time with us this afternoon. I'm, uh, I have a big, long name, Dr. Jonathan Daniel Callender, but you can all just call me John. Can you say hi, John? All right, and also please say hello to our panel here. You can give them a big wave and hi. Um, I'm just gonna briefly name them and then I'm gonna give them more proper introductions. We have uh, Tanya, we have Celeste, we have Kate, Loveline, Alexandra, and Cassandra. You're gonna hear more from each of them shortly, uh, but just to make the best use of time, I'm going to walk you through what I've learned about uh, skill trades and as someone who has an employment researcher, for anyone here who's interested in research, you get to choose what area of research you want to go into. And for me, it was jobs. And I discovered about, let's say, four or five years ago, an area of work where there happens to be very satisfied workers that I think some of you learned today, a lot of people don't know a lot about, and they are in skilled trades. And then I learned something that wasn't available to me at 42 years old right now, in high school, when I was in high school, we didn't have an OYAP program where you could pursue a skilled trade and right after high school, find yourself fully employed or on your way to becoming fully employed. Thankfully, you have that resource today. Uh, so I'm gonna talk with you about five reasons for a career in an apprenticeship. And I'm also going to show you some video clips. Everybody, I've had the honor of interviewing one-on-one -on -one about 150 skilled trades people in Ontario, including women in skilled trades. And you're going to see some clips hearing from them. And then, of course, you get the live version. And I'll be running two panels with these outstanding trades women. So I want to ask you a question. It's a kind of a research question. Someone shout out an answer. Be honest. What makes a good job? Money, okay, safety, sure. What else? Stability, thank you. Insurance, a union, <laughs> wonderful. What else? A good manager. A good manager, what else makes a good job? Thank you. Retirement, early retirement, benefits, all good answers, everyone. Common ones. One more time. Pension, you got it. Well, when I ask more people, these are the types of answers that I get. Just like you said, a good job is one where you are a good salary, even a great salary, where you can get things like a good dental plan and a pension and early retirement. Very common nowadays. Advancement opportunities, the ability to earn more money, quicker, earn better benefits. COVID-19 revealed the importance of job security. A good job is one that's going to be there during a crisis, or five, 10, 15 years from now, we also hear other types of reasons for a good job. It's one that's fun, it's fulfilling. You like the people that you work with, good coworkers. You maybe can say how you help people in a certain way. Work-life balance, be able to just, when you're done work, leave work at work, and you're not logging in back to work in the evening, at the dinner table, on vacation, which some of you might observe in other adults in your life maybe have the opportunity to be your own boss. Great answers to this question B of, of what makes a good job. So as I mentioned, I've studied thousands of Canadian workers and I've learned a lot about skilled trades people. And without going deep into that study, I'm gonna tell you the headline. It's that uh, everybody, trades people, are among the happiest workers in the country. They have work-life balance. You've heard a lot about this this morning. They make excellent salaries for their age. They're able to start their life early in their 20s, not negotiating how much longer they can stay at home and live with their parents into their 20s and 30s, but they are making investments in their adulthood, buying homes, buying condos, buying vehicles, start going on long vacations, starting families earlier in life. Why? Because they can because they can afford to do so. Many people in skilled trades don't have to go to university. Most don't have to go to university and don't have to pay a lot of tuition debt in order to get their specialization. So that works out well when you're trying to make um, investments in your life. So quick test, someone shout out a skilled trade that you learned today. Wow. 
Okay. What was that? Hairstylist. Hairstylist. Carpenter. Anybody else? Plumber. Baker. Baker. Right on. Right on. And we could go on. You might remember there are more than 140 skilled trades that can be explored in high school in motive power, services, construction, or any industrial skilled trades. And we have all of them represented on the stage today. Uh, that's through the OYAP program. As you know, between the summer of grade 11 and 12, that's the earliest you can sign up. If not then, go for it in grade 11. Go for it in grade 12, where you can learn, you know, you can make beautiful things in the skilled trades, depending on your area of work there. By the way, that's Alexandra, she's right there <laughs> in the middle, um, right? Uh, you can fix things, right? You have the opportunity to restore things. This is Celeste right here, our brick and stone mason. Uh, hairstylist, right? You can make people smile. There are many jobs in a skilled trade where you wake up in the morning and you know that you can just put a smile on people's faces. Hey, you look pretty familiar. That's uh, Caitlin over here. Um, we have uh, preparing delicious food. Anyone interested in food prep? Helping build homes. You can give power to communities, right? Have that responsibility in a crisis, everybody. We call on healthcare workers. We call upon uh, first responders, but many forget we call on electricians and plumbers and brick and stone masons and roofers to do the work that most people have no idea to do their own. And they have to call upon an expert who specialized, who pursued excellence in something that others weren't able to do. Control water like plumbers. Take care of vehicles, like truck and coach technicians. We have one right here, my friend Tanya. Auto body apprentices. Um, draw, operate those things that you used to play with maybe in the sandbox, the real world versions of that, like Larissa here, who's a bulldozer operator. You can coordinate projects. Skilled trades people are often asked to step up and do some project coordinating or become supervisors. So I'm going to now show you some clips uh, just before I bring up our, our panels. And I'm going to just say one thing for anyone who forgot, right, you know, the path to a skilled trade starts with an apprenticeship. That's when you learn, you get a mentor, either an individual or persons that help you, train you, but you also get paid through a registered apprenticeship while you're going to class, while you're going to school. You earn money as you're learning. So that's going to be part of these five reasons to try an apprenticeship. One is you get work experience, right? For me, getting work experience when I was in high school was delivering newspapers. For others in your, uh, you know, in your community, it might be working at a fast food restaurant, it might be pushing shopping carts, working a cashier. There are other ways to get work experience while in high school uh, through the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program. Uh, but don't take my word for it. Here uh, from some other young women who are about 15, 16 years old, uh, getting work experience. We test wire connections and voltages, troubleshoot electrical issues, and wire electronic components. I'm currently working in the wood mill, and a lot of what I'm doing right now is just observing different types of work, different machines, how they work, how to use them safely, and all aspects of carpentry. What I like most about my apprenticeship is the learning experience. I've learned a lot of things that I'd otherwise never get a chance to learn in a classroom setting, and it's been a really unique experience. All right different than the classroom setting. If anyone wants to get out of the classroom into a different environment, OYAP is the way to do it. You also get to work with your hands. And I call this an application of balanced intelligence. Intelligence, everyone, is just the ability to see patterns. If anyone takes an IQ test, you go to IQ test, it shows you four things and says what comes next in this sequence, right? Well, it's just pattern recognition. And we tend to applaud those who see more patterns in words and in history and numbers. We say the academic types, they're the smart ones who see patterns and those types of things. We have to remember that there are people who see patterns in the real world. Someone sees patterns in how to take water from extremely far away and bring it into an entire home, uh, excuse me, city and into individual homes and hospitals and schools and rooms. Someone sees patterns in how the electrical grid works, without which we wouldn't have our civilization. Who see patterns in how to take ingredients that are so distinct and separate, fuse them together to make something delicious and nutritious. 
who see patterns in how roads and bridges are built and maintained over different weather patterns, how large machinery works and how to fix them, and more. Balanced intelligence, just as important as academic intelligence, and in the real world, certainly very, very important. So hear from a few young women talking about the benefits of uh, sort of working with their hands. Here we go. Well, the thing I find this is you get to do both. You not only get to stand back and watch the mechanics, but you also get to be with them. You get to stand beside the mechanics and learn how they're doing it. You get to learn information that isn't in your textbook. You get to learn hands-on material that no one can teach you but a mechanic. No matter what, a machine is a machine. It doesn't matter whether it's making uh, automotive parts or if it's a roller coaster, a bearing is a bearing. So if you know the bearing, you know how to fix it, you know how, to, how it works, no matter what it's in, even if it's in your washing machine, you can fix it. So you're very versatile. I guess some misconceptions in the trade is that women can't do as good a job as men. <laughs> we can do it and we can do it better. <laughs> I'm really detail oriented. So when I'm working on something, I want to make sure it looks good and I want to make sure it's functional. Excellent. Okay, another reason to try a skill trade in high school is knowing that you have support. Some people, you get so used to going from home to school that this idea of leaving the classroom makes me maybe nervous. I don't really want to do something that breaks with the routine. Am I going to be by myself? It's not the case. You have help. And I want you to hear from some young women who are talking about the help that they got from their co-op teachers. You're not going out on an apprenticeship all by yourself. You have support. Here we go. Second last clip. Well, by talking to my co-op teacher, Mr. Polilo, and expressing I wanted to try a career in the trade. He brought me to the owner, Kyle, and he gave me an interview and then brought me onto Arts Electricals. Mr. Polito supported me during my placement by checking on me, making sure that I was okay. He does visits with us just to make sure that we're safe and happy with our placement, and he made sure that this was the right choice for me. I secured my co-op by getting a summer placement job, and then I worked my way up so I was hired on, and my co-op teacher would always come in and check on us and make sure we were doing okay, and if we were ever having any doubts, she would always come and help us. I secured my co-op placement through my co-op teachers. They actually knew the owners of the company that I worked for. They also came and checked in on me on job sites as well as answer any questions I needed answered. There you go. So you heard from the young women themselves. They're not by themselves. They always have help. So learn how to run a business. Many people are wanting to be entrepreneurs these days where well, you can get actual on the job uh, experience learning from someone often who is an owner themselves. Okay, we have examples of entrepreneurship on this stage as well. I want you to see now in this last clip of uh, two uh, individuals, two guys who graduated from a high school from the OEAP program, started their own businesses, and now are hiring, hiring young people actually from their high schools. So full circle, we also hear from a few young women uh, who have been inspired by the opportunity in skilled trades to start their own businesses. High school, the apprenticeship program taught me a lot of things like patience, perseverance, and risk taking. Now that I have my own business, I decided to partner with OEF because I think it's a great way to get the students out of the classroom and into the workforce. I worked for a contractor who needed me to open my own business. So I took that opportunity to open a female's touch renovations, which is AFT for short. I take that business and I actually use it to be able to do side jobs once in a while. I love the people I'm working with and I'm learning something new every day. What I hope to do in the future is have my own women's masonry company where I can teach women the craft, but also introduce girls into the trade. So if the last two look familiar, it was Alexandra and Celeste here on, on, on stage. So everybody, Lastly, earn while you learn. I, if you're a registered apprenticeship, you can earn money while being trained. Uh, the average tuition debt, you want a reality check, okay? Uh, from graduation from college in Ontario, this is from Statistics Canada, $16,500. A graduation debt from university, $30,000. Okay, for some people this is no problem. Others, it's a serious consideration. I wish more people were aware of the annual cost of a registered apprenticeship. Does anybody know what that is? How much does it cost annually for a registered apprenticeship post-secondary path? Any guesses? $400 a year. 
Okay? I just blow your mind. That's it. But you heard you also get paid. You make money while you're being trained. Whether it's a two year, three year, four year apprenticeship, apprentices earn money while they're learning. So five reasons everyone to try an apprenticeship. Get some work experience, work with your hands, have teacher support, and also learn how to run a business and earn while you learn. So that brings me now, for anyone who wants to watch any videos with young people in skilled trades, go to jobtalksoeap.com or just search Job Talks in YouTube. But now we get to the highlight of today, in my opinion, and that is our two discussions with, uh, uh, we have three at a time discussions with uh, beginning with Tanya Day, truck and coach technician, Celeste Lamondin, brick and stone mason, and of course, Kate Parr, plant technician and millwright. Give them a round of applause, please, to we'll start it off. So I asked everyone who is here on stage to uh, explain what they do in 10 words or less, but also to bring something that they can't do without on the job, and to also share a little bit with all of you about why they got interested. So I'm gonna start, Tanya, with you. If you could uh, explain what do you do as a trucking coach technician, how did you get interested, and uh, what did you bring to show everyone? Okay, so um, I inspect and repair buses to move people throughout Toronto, so I work for the TTC. Um, I got interested because I did go to university, I graduated, I was working in finance on University Ave, and at that time the stock market crashed and a lot of us were losing our jobs in high places and me at the time in entry level. At that point, I mean, even with the degree, I was depending on a company to hire me for my employment to make money. So I decided to do what I had already had interest in from high school and I went and I took a course in automotive. Um, through there, um, I got a co-op program where they hired me on and I completed that to getting my full license in automotive trades and I decided to continue on. And so now I also have a second license as a coach technician with the uh, TTC. Today, the tool that I decided to bring, you can't do without this at all in automotive. It's an air ratchet gun. Through the bottom here, 90 PSI air inlet is put through the gun. It torques to about 7,500 RPMs. Um, it can break away a bolt at like 2,200 foot-pounds. Um, this is good for putting on wheel nuts, removing bolts on heavy su suspension parts. Um, it saves you on your wrist, all that force and the constant rotations that you would have to do. And it's also very cool and badass to use. Um, it's, you can't do without this. This is actually in coach tech now, moving out of automotive. We have even larger ones where you have to use with two hands. Awesome, awesome, Tanya. And uh, Celeste, how about you? Oops, sorry. What do you do? Oh. What, how did you get started? <laughs> and what did you bring? So, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a brick and stone mason. And basically what I do is I build and restore homes using brick or stone. and the tool that I brought is called a trowel, and basically it's like the extension of your hand. So we use it to scoop up mortar, and mortar is basically like the glue between brick and stone. And it just helps us like precisely and accurately lay mortar bed so that we can lay our units on top of it. And basically the reason I got interested in the trades is because I was working jobs from like 18 to 19, and I was always inside, and. I really wanted to spend a summer outside, just in the sun, getting strong. And so I did a, a part-time job as a laborer, as, sorry, as a laborer for a landscape company. And basically I was introduced to the apprenticeship through my boss and he told me like, go ahead, try it out, see if you like it. And from there, I was working on residential homes doing new build. And then I started commercial new build, which are more schools and after that, I went to Heritage Masonry, which is basically we're restoring really old homes in Toronto, and this is by far my favorite out of everything. Awesome, thank you, Celeste. Love how you had to figure out which things to do before you ultimately discovered the area that you loved. Kate, how about you? What do you do in 10 words or less? How did you get started? What did you bring? All right, so currently what I do in 10 words or less, I say that I keep the lights on for Ontario. So my license, my red seal, is in Millwright. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, can I see by a show of hands who knows what a Millwright is? 
Okay, I get that a lot. Uh, I don't blame you. So a millwright is an industrial mechanic. So just like you have a mechanic for truck and coach or for automotive, I'm a mechanic of the industrial world. So you think about a pulp and paper mill, Canada's wonderland, um, a food manufacturing facility, a power plant. All of those industries need mechanics to fix the equipment within those industries, and that's, that's my role. I work at a power plant as a plant technician, and I combine operations so I know how to operate the power plant and when something goes wrong or on a planned shutdown I know how to fix the equipment within the power plant. So how I got started within Millwright um, in high school I had the opportunity to take some tech classes and I always thought that you know I really enjoyed it but I didn't know that that was an option because I thought I would always go to university and follow in my parents footsteps. I felt the pressure in grade 11 and 12 to figure out what I wanted to do and I asked myself pretty plainly, what makes me happy? And the only thing in high school, or the only thing that I thought I would enjoy outside of high school was working with my hands, was working in the skilled trades. So I did a co-op in automotive. I loved it, but I knew that I didn't want to work on cars every day. And a few people had suggested that because I enjoyed machining and welding and mechanics, Millwright was the perfect trade to incorporate all of those. So I decided to do an apprenticeship, and that was four years. Then I got my red seal. Now I've transitioned into uh, the power industry. So the tool that I brought today is called a micrometer. It's a precision measurement device, and I thought that this was a good example because millwrights work within one one-thousandth of an inch. So where, let's say, a carpenter might work within um, fractions of an inch, these are fractions, but take one inch and divide it by a thousand. This is a tolerance that I have to work within, and this is one of the only tools that we can use on site to measure that. So. Excellent, very cool, a micrometer. Thank you very much, Kate. I'm going to change what I said earlier, and I think it's a good time, too, to actually bring in the other tradeswomen on the stage. Uh, so I'm just going to also ask you all to please welcome Loveline Carpenter, uh, uh, excuse me, Loveline Carpenter, Loveline Sarah uh, Carpenter, Alexandra Wells, tile setter and business owner, and Cassandra Noseworthy, chef. Please join them. Give them a round of applause. Thanks, everybody. Just as, uh, um, as we shift our eyes to the side of the room, now Loveline, same question to you. I think everyone wants to know, how would you describe what you do as a carpenter? How did you get started and what can you show us? Um, hello, hi. So I'm actually a carpenter and um, I've been a carpenter for about six years now. And um, I was actually, during in high school, I was in a completely different pathway. I was going to university. It was a lot different, but I was taking like my wood shop. And just like the summer of grade 11, I decided that I just wanted to change it completely. I wanted to like have a family. I wanted to be able to afford a family and just change everything. So I like changed all of my courses from like university to college, talked to my co-op teacher, and I completely changed it. And um, I joined the OYAP program, so the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program. I actually went through that. And I built houses with Habitat for Humanity for two years in high school. And that's like a whole uh, really, like, really nice organization that they build houses for the poverty ridden. But so I did that. And then my co-op teacher actually helped me join the union right after high school. So he was still with me. I joined the union and I built houses for two years. And then I joined the company that I've been now with for five years. So that was like my whole history for that but then it's still going great. And um, for my tool, I actually brought, I was gonna bring a saw, because I did last year, and John was like, yeah, bring it, it's so cool, they'll love it. But it's too big, I don't think your school would let me. So I brought my impact driver, and um, this is DeWalt, it's not Milwaukee or Hilsey, because I know that was an argument. Um, we, this is like, if you guys are at school and you have a pencil, this is our pencil at work, like um, my job, I would never be able to get anything done without this. It's honestly like, it's just a screw in, puts in screws, changes the bit all the time and stuff. And I actually work with, um, as a carpenter, like I build houses, but I, I actually work with IMP panels now. So we build like Ikea's, Costco's, Loblaws, Metro's, just like, um, it's like an insulated panel that keeps the temperature inside inside because it's, insula it's insulated. And that just shows you where carpentry can take you. But yeah. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Lovely. And Alexandra, how about you?
Uh, but yourself, tile setter and business owner. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Alexandra. I've uh, been in construction for about 10 plus years now. Um, I went to Toronto District School Boards and I started in a co-op um, called the Step to Construction. It's actually ran by um, Alvi Morrow out of, um, out of the TDSB board and it is a fantastic program. I went into the program um, with, uh, with the idea that I was gonna be a carpenter. I very much enjoy cabinet making. I like the artistic aspect of construction. And um, so they put you on a construction site and they actually allow you to go through all of the different trades. So I was a carpenter for a couple of weeks. I was a tile setter, I was a drywaller, plumber, electrician, pretty much anything um, construction related. I got to uh, immerse in a little bit. And so I went in as a carpenter, came out as a tile setter um, because I found that it was a lot more um, my field and my artistic um, dr drive because it's just very pretty when you actually get everything finished and put together. Um, so yeah, so I went through that co-op, then I um, went through a different couple of uh, companies. I became the first woman in that co-op, then I did the first woman in 183 as the tile setter. I became the first woman uh, foreman for uh, my companies that I've worked for. I've ran crews up to about 20 different men, um, four different towers, and then I uh, worked for a company and I didn't like how they were treating their installers. So I decided that, you know what, I do all of the things that are necessary to run the company, I might as well just open up my own. So um, I did, and uh, that's a Females Touch Renovations Incorporated. And I've been running my company, uh, sol solely my company for about um, six months now. And I'm doing wonderful, um, very busy. I actually very much enjoy it. Every day is a little bit different. Um, and, and it's fantastic. So it, you always can grow in construction. It's, there is no roof because we're the ones building it, right? Um, so my tool that I brought, it's actually over here because it's a little bit bigger. Thank you. I'll hold it up. <laughs> so it's actually a tile cutter. And so what it is, is I can actually cut tile completely dustless with it. It's compact. Uh, we're out the other way. Right, so it actually goes together. Right, so now you actually pretty much have a straight T-bar. So I can put whatever size I want and without even needing anything, I can t cut my tile, wow. right? Was, and so you pretty much have a brand new edge to it. Um, and at, at that point in time, you're only measuring a little bit, right? Um, you have, it, it keeps it nice and clean, and, uh, and I can't work without it. It's one of my, it, it's again, yeah, it's, uh, it's like my second arm. <laughs> if, if I don't have it, then I can't do my job properly. So, but, uh, yeah. Thank you, Alexandra. That was an awesome demonstration. Uh, right on, yeah, for sure. Uh, I know Miss uh, Mayette is watching because she was talking earlier about doing her own tile work and wasn't sure she would be able to do it. <laughs> Actually, I think you knew you should do it, but now you know. You can do it that's mm -hmm. it, that's it. Uh, Cassandra Noseworthy, chef. Hello, hello. Uh, maybe you should hire her to do tile work. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm, usually I go by Cass, I'm a chef. Um, how I got into this industry, actually, similar to Loveline, I was very much on the track to going to medical school. All of the stuff that I did in high school was very much going in that direction. Everything I wanted to do was heavy, heavy sciences. That's, I was like, this is the way that I'm gonna go. Everything pointed in that direction. And I wanted to go specifically into trauma surgery in the military. And then I went, signed up, I did all the things, and they were like, okay, go get me just a college thing and then come back and we'll sort it out. And I was like, okay, sounds good. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna go take culinary. And then I walked into culinary, and that was nine years ago, and that's it, it stuck. It was, it was so perfect. It was this beautiful amalgamation of science and art and 
just high octane, intense situations. And it was just everything that you could ever need all wrapped up in this one thing. And from immediately starting school, I had a job. You can go into a kitchen the day that you decide you want to be in that field and you work your way up. It doesn't matter if you have the highest level of education, if you have college, if you have university or whatever you have in kitchens, you start on the garde manger, which is like the cold side, and then you work your way up, guaranteed. So you bounce from station to station to station. You can work in culturally diverse foods. You can work at high level Michelin. You can go do television. You can do food studies research, which is what I do now. And the doors are just everywhere. So the tool that I decided to bring was, actually I brought two specifically because they have fun stories. So yeah, look, I brought a towel. No, no, I brought knives. Knives are cool. So this one, the little guy, is my 1.7 millimeter Gyoto. It it has a full tang mahogany handle that is cured with beeswax. It is the skinniest, tiniest little thing ever. As like the rest of our tools, it is an extension of my arm. That is it. I won't go anywhere without my knives. They are essential to everything that I do. This one in particular, absolutely stunning, super gorgeous, cost me a ridiculous amount of money, and I love it dearly. This one is my Chinese cleaver. Uh, this is the one that I actually use all the time and it cost me 20 bucks. <laughs> Without a doubt. It, it, this one's nice, it's super cool. I got it as a present for myself back in the day. And, but fundamentally, this is what you need. So you'll see a lot in culinary world, there's this huge breadth of people who connect in specific ways. Lots of people are like, oh, you gotta be perfectly French. You gotta do high level fine dining. That's the only way to go. That's not true, that's not true at all. It's not the knife that makes the chef. The chef makes the knife. It doesn't matter what you use. If you have the drive, you have the ambition, you have the desire to succeed, it will happen for you in this industry. Excellent, very well said. I love how calm Alexandra was next, sitting next to you with the knife wielding. Yeah. That's so cool. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask uh, maybe Alexandra to pass, we'll have one microphone on each side. So. Um, I'm going to give this next question to Kate. Kate, you mentioned, uh, Kate Parr, you mentioned uh, Red Seal. Uh, and uh, there are some, there are a number of you, can you put your hands up, by the way, if you are a Red Seal in your skill trade? How many here? Okay. So, uh, we do have a group that um, has to exit early, so no problem. Can you explain to everyone, Kate, what uh, a red seal is, how it has benefited you, and, and why people might want to keep that in mind. Absolutely. So a red seal is a certification that is valid across Canada. So a nice way that I like to explain it, a millwright is a millwright from coast to coast and pretty well around the world because the skills that go into that trade are, are quite vast, but a machine is a machine, right? Let's take an arborist in Newfoundland where the trees are this tall and compare it to an arborist in British Columbia where the trees are maybe hundreds of feet tall. That trade is too different, therefore it's not federally or it's not nationally the same, right? So within a red seal, you could practice in Ontario, um, obtain a red seal, which, which means that you have finished your apprenticeship and then written exams. You have all your apprenticeship hours, your school, you pass the final exams and then you're qualified within that skilled trade. So a red seal trade means that even if you learn in Ontario, you could move to British Columbia or any province or territory and that certification would be valid. Excellent. Uh, Tanya, can you say a little more about Red Seal? Well, um, yeah, you covered much, basically everything, but I would say it's basically a free ticket to anywhere in Canada. Um, I have know someone right now who just accepted a position in Vancouver because they had a Red Seal trade that they could just move. Um, I also know that through the automotive um, industry, compared to the U.S., they don't have anything that is to the same quality and standards as we do here in Canada. So you leaving Canada and going to the States with your Red Seal trade, you have, you're highly regarded and there's more doors open to you. And that also even converts over into Europe. So um, it's just a, 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 another tool to have on your belt. Um, freedom, empowerment as a woman in the trades. Excellent, great answer, great answer. Uh, 
Celeste, uh, how has uh, being a brick and stone mason uh, been a benefit to you the most? Uh, what's been the, what has it brought to your life? I would say the biggest benefit, which sounds a little bad, is the money that I've gotten. <laughs> so before, <laughs> before I got into the trade, I was not financially stable and I very much had to do it on my own. I was living on my own and I had to take care of myself. And I had to find a career that would support me in the lifestyle that I wanted. So when I got into the trade, because it is an apprenticeship, you are going to be paid like a certain amount of money each year of your apprenticeship. And then when I finished it, I think because of the company and the type of masonry I was doing, you make a very good wage. And so I would say being a heritage mason has given me financial stability and freedom because now I've, I'm doing things that I never thought was possible when I was 19. You hear that? Financial stability and freedom. Excellent. Um, uh, Cassie, do you want to say anything about your Red Seal? Culinary Red Seal is a very practical thing that is available. Uh, it's not mandatory for you to have it, but it is a really cool thing to be able to have like certified I'm a chef. And then again, it transfers your skills all throughout Canada and you don't ever have to. There's this sense as a woman working in the culinary industry where every time you start a new restaurant, you got to prove yourself over and over again. And getting a Red Seal is just an opportunity where you don't have to do that again. You just get to go, look, here. Um, Loveline, uh, you know, it's for some people sort of looking on stage, you see all these tools on the stage, uh, and when Alexander's busting out the tile cutter, uh, it kind of, you, you sort of may look easy, but there are those who have this impression that the skilled trades are physically demanding. Uh, what's your response to that? How accurate is it? Um, what do you say to people who assume that maybe the job is too physically demanding for you? If something's too physically demanding for all of us, I think it's just a good exercise, no? Um, when I first joined, like, I was into carpentry when I was 18. So you will, like, I'm not saying that you're not as strong as the men, but, like, like I'm pretty strong, you know? And it's nice to see their faces when you can prove them wrong, too, especially when they think you can't do it, and then you're able to lift it, you know what I mean? They'll come over, they're like, oh, do you want some help? It's like, no, I don't need your help. I don't want your help, you know? But... The thing about physically demanding is like it's a good exercise you know like at least you don't have to go to the gym after work um and a good thing about it is like you have to be really careful about how you do use your body especially in labor because it is a labor intensive job we do like as carpentries i don't know about everyone else but i'm part of the union so we have benefits we have massage benefits like chiropractor benefits so that's like a really good pro to it but just because something's physically demanding, I don't think you should be scared to do it. If you do it wrong, that's when, that's your fault. But you can, you like, you learn how to like lift with your knees, lift with your legs, not lift with your back. Because in the long run, that's why a lot of the older generation have like problems because they weren't doing things the right way. But now safety is a really big thing in construction. Like it's very, very important. And they implement that a lot. Just safe handling of like, just like your body, because like your, your body is a tool as well. So how you use it is important. You only have two arms, two legs, two eyes, right? So. Well said, uh, Lena. And uh, Alexander, there's a lot, you know, there's a movement now, you know, work from home, wake up, keep your pajama pants on, slide onto the next room, maybe turn on the camera. Uh, what's your response to that? You know, we now have more and more sort of work workplaces where it's just never leaving your house uh, and some people might even think hey that sounds good sounds cool uh, what do you say about the benefits of having work that challenges you physically so i very much enjoy having to leave my house um i to be honest if my work space was in my house i'd probably still be late like <laughs> um i uh, i definitely need the the new environments the um the challenge of every day of of something different um working from home is great yeah you'd be able to go into your kitchen and cook for yourself and and have those wonderful naps for like break time and stuff like that um but there's also like just like our our work is physically demanding um working from home can also be psychologically demanding i actually used to work um in 
part of my job was um, was dealing with homeowners and customer service and everything like that and and paperwork and to be honest I believe that I was even more I was psychologically exhausted from a day in the office than I ever have been installing tile right um, I like talking to people and problem solving and paperwork and and my eyes looking at the screen all day um, it, it my wrist typing and all that sort of stuff so every every job has its uh, I think it's er ergonomic ergonomic <laughs> sorry uh, yeah. yeah right so, um, they they all have their problems right so so many people think that construction is labor and oh you're gonna have like tile setters whereas oh you're gonna have really bad knee problems when you get older or you're gonna have really back uh, bad back problems and my my thing is that um, I wear my knee pads when I need to I protect myself just like when I'm grinding I wear my safety glasses or my earmuffs um, when I'm installing floors I wear my knee pads right um, if they're big tiles I get another person to help me um, a, a lot of things that I find in in my workspace is that and and I don't know if this goes uh, for everybody but I know because I'm a woman I tend to ask for help and and a lot of men don't do that so I find that I actually don't hurt myself as often because I actually ask for that help if it's gonna be strenuous strenuous that yeah that word um, uh, I ask for that help so that I don't hurt myself right so I think uh, I work smarter than harder right so Cassie, you're on your feet for a part of the job, right, being a chef? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's, there's a little bit of standing involved. Um, I, I love it. I love how active I am constantly. I am sore, I am sweaty, and I am stronger than every single dude I know. And that is awesome. It is so sick. And, like, there is nothing quite as satisfying as having, like, your big fancy Gordon Ramsay head chef come up to you and be like, no, no, man, I got it. And I'm like, get out of here. No, I got it. I got it because I'm stronger than you are. So no, no, we don't need that. It, it's spectacular. And yes, you have to be very conscious to make sure that you take care of your body. Your body is a tool. Follow the instructions. Like, don't go throwing around stuff that's insanely heavy. Use a back brace if you need to use a back brace. Make sure that you have great shoes. Spend the money on the shoes. Don't spend the money on the knife. Get the $20 knife. Spend the money on the shoes. And it's really supportive. But fundamentally, the alternative is you're sitting in a chair all day, which is just as bad for you as anything else. So everything in moderation and keep it organized. Right, that's great advice. Uh, let's talk about the fact that like, maybe with the exception of culinary, most of the... Uh, uh, everyone, people on the stage here are in jobs that would be considered male-dominated professions. Culinary too, or culinary male-dominated oh as well. Oh my so, god, you know? yes. So, uh, Kate, start us off. What's it like being a woman in a skilled trade that is uh, comprises mostly men? How are you? It's certainly interesting. Um, every company that I have worked for, I've been the only woman within the company, and I now work for Capital Power, and I'm the first woman in both operations and maintenance throughout the entire province. So it was quite a big deal um, hiring me. I guess there was a lot of consideration that went into hiring me. Um, but I'd worked at these sites as a foreman, so every you know all the management knew who I was, and they knew that I was decently good at what I do. Um, so I didn't feel like it was all about diversity. There is a, a push to have more women working within these industries and with more awareness um, comes more population and I only see the numbers of women increasing. So for my experience um, starting out I've never worked alongside another woman and that is tough. However there are a lot of groups within Ontario or across Canada for uniting tradeswomen. There's a lot of forums you can ask questions, you can go for coffee with tradeswomen and you have a network of people that you can talk to. Um, so the support matters. I think that matters true in in any career that you choose having a mentor or having a support group of people who are similar to you um, to the to touch on working like with men or working in a male dominated sector I think you just need to understand who you are what skills you bring to the table and have some confidence within yourself because I think the fact that as a woman you have to work that like 
you know, 50% harder than all the men. Unfortunately, that is true because you have to not only just show up, but prove yourself to every single person that you, that you meet. I used to work as a contractor. I meet hundreds of people a day, and every single day you're showing up, you have to prove yourself. That is difficult, but you build so much confidence within your abilities and within yourself, and I know that there's pretty well any situation I can be thrown into, and it's a matter of, okay, this is what needs to be done. Let's get it done. And I'll be honest, as a woman, that's incredibly empowering. Awesome, very inspirational, especially uh, that you are the first woman to be offered that position in Ontario. Amazing, right, everybody? Uh, Celeste, you work around a lot of men too, for sure, as a brick and stone mason. How has that been? I would say in the beginning, it was not inclusive at all. I was rejected from a lot of jobs, and this was, I'm not trying to bag on the union, but this was in the union. But the union, I have to say, if you're gonna go into it, they are being more progressive and they want women. But in my experience, it was very challenging in the beginning. And what happened is I would change companies. As soon as something would happen and I knew I wasn't being respected, I would go to another company. Like you can drop them, you have your skills and you take it somewhere else. And then I got to the company that I'm currently at and it, it has been amazing. Like he's given me so many opportunities to learn. He has pushed me so hard in the trade. And I think the biggest thing here is find where you're welcome because there was, I couldn't again, like imagine being where I am now for all these small things. Without him, I wouldn't be the Mason I am today. So again, find that support. Remember that you can always find, if you ask, you don't know unless you ask for that help uh, and that support. Uh, Tanya, at the uh, TTC, yeah. how's it going there? Oh, it's going great. Um, I'm not the first mechanic there, um, but I am one of the f maybe fifth there. Um, I don't know what further to say. Um, working with the men, I know for a lot of them, I was the first woman that they've worked with. Um, especially when I was in the dealership, I was the absolute first um, every day. Sometimes as I'm working, you know, you feel eyes and I'll see a guy like, oh, I was going to offer you help, but clearly you have it under control. Mm -hmm. And it makes me feel better in that sense. Um, as women, too, we take more pride in like understanding what we're working on, following procedures. We're more detail oriented. So in time, they're going to see that you have a lot more to bring on the table. And there's been positions where I've been at the forefront of starting a new um, project that we were doing on a new part of the bus or um, start anything. I'm, I'm always now the one that they go to because they know that they can rely on me. So I've been able to prove myself just by being there. And again, like you said, stepping in there with confidence because you can do the job and you know the job. And there is no difference between me and a guy essentially, really. It's just the construct that we've had in our mind. I mean, for moving from an automobile and now I'm working on trucks or huge buses, tires are like this big. There are tools that are there for you. You don't have to be a bodybuilder. That's another misconception. You don't have to be overly strong, you can do it. So um, I think every day I step in as a pioneer or an ambassador, just opening the forefront to other females coming through. And there have been some coming through and I'm excited to see them and I'm excited to see more of you guys join us. Well said, well said. Well said. Uh, let's stay on this topic of, uh, of facing some challenges. Just with the, uh, the other side here, Loveleen, what can you say about some challenges that you've uh, experienced and how you've overcome them? Um, the whole like men thing is definitely a thing for the trades. Um, I actually, my first job with the union was with uh, a grocery store in Toronto and it was just building and he actually like the foreman there came up to me and he told me that I'd never touch a tool and I actually spent my day, that was my first job out of high school and I spent that day on my hands and knees scrubbing the floor at a job, at a union job, and I didn't never went back there again. But like she said about finding the right people, the job right after that is the same job I'm at now, five years later. And like, it's crazy how much trust they, like, as a woman, you get so much respect. Out of the majority of men, you get a lot of respect in the trade, but there's obviously a select few that think that you can't do it, or you're not strong enough for it, you don't know what you're doing with like drawings and stuff like that, but then, when they see that, like, you're the one that people come to for answers, like, if you're taking charge of a crew and stuff like that, that's, like, a big difference right there. And one of the issues I had was, like, my parents. 
because I am like an immigrant's uh, daughter. And they were like, because I was going into the trades and that's not really like, they came here for a better life and you're over here going into construction, you know, like outside in the cold or whatever. So that did not go down well with my family. It still doesn't, but obviously now like, the whole financial aspect when they see how much money, I'm sorry, I don't mean it like that. Like, I don't mean to make this about money, but to see how much money you're actually making or like just how happy you are on the regular. Like I was, like when I turned 18 and I started working and you get paid as you do your apprenticeship, you're making a lot more money than anyone else your age. Now too, if you save it and you're smart with it, you have a lot more money. I can guarantee you a lot of people, all these people on stage, yeah, they got money. So, I mean, you could tell by her tattoos, but like, that's one thing, like financial freedom. And when you show that to people, like they'll understand like how, it's hard getting up at four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning to go to work. It really is. But when you see your, when you see your pay stuff at the end of the week, it's really worth it. And um, that's the thing, like you get up every single day, you get up at four o'clock, three o'clock if you're farther away and you're working a long day until six in the afternoon or five, and that gets hard, right? Doing it every single day for God knows how long until pension hits. But then you realize like you're going, like work is like, I'm just hanging out with a bunch of guys. Like work isn't work. I'm not behind a computer screen. I'm just hanging out with my friends, doing work, getting paid for it. And then I'm going home at the end of the day. And that's like the biggest thing to me. Like I'm sure all of these people can agree. I'm happy with my job and I'm only 22. I'm happy with, how life has been going so far financially. I still, like, I, it takes out a lot of time, like five days a week, like you're busy, right? But you're able to go out with the girls on Friday night or on the weekend. You're allowed to go on, like, you're able to afford that vacation. You can buy a house. You can buy yourself that makeup, you know? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's all worth it. That's all I have to say. So that's, that was a lot to say. That was beautiful. Yeah, well said. No. Um, it's, uh, I, I like that you also pointed out that you're, you know, you're honest about how, you're, you know, how your parents felt and you're still working through that. But also, I'm guessing your parents will not be retiring uh, at, you know, at age 52, exactly. right? Which most people, anyone on the stage here, because they started so young, are going to be a retirement in their early 50s, when most people in other careers, as some of you know, retire in their late 60s. Uh, that's a that's a huge uh, difference in time, Alexandra. Any challenges that you've been you faced and how you overcame them? Um, so I'm actually going to go the other way with like the male dominance. Um, I've actually had so I've worked in the industry for ten years. I've worked around men um, pretty much my whole life. I was on the guys football team, guys rugby team in high school. Um, then I went into a male dominated area. Um, I've always fit in with the tomboys. I, I don't do office work very well. Um, I'm sometimes I'm too vulgar for them. Um, I'm I'm too assertive. I'm too aggressive. Um, whereas the men, I just fit in, right? We, the thing is, is that you, they they kind of, you sit there and you have an argument with a man, and the argument's done after you guys figure out what you're gonna do. Um, I've actually had a lot of problems with women in construction. Um, supervisors that where they're the first woman and on the construction site and then I show up and um, I'm all of a sudden the person that the, the men want to talk to or or hang out with and I've actually had um, of jealousy problems and that this that and the other thing and when women are in that sort of power um, they can make your life a little difficult so um, a lot of people don't don't talk about that but I've actually had um, that in, uh, that uh, experience as well, whereas it's not actually the men who who have the problem with you, it's it's the women that sometimes take on that role. And um, my all of my crews have always been family, like jumping from, um, just like Cass said, jumping from kitchen to kitchen. Same with crews, like if you go from one job site to another job site, that first couple of months is just horrific because you're, you're reproving that, um, especially when I was in the, the four woman position, um, if I ever had a male beside me and we walked up to somebody and we had something to discuss, they were always gonna talk to my male counterpart instead of me first. And, and it was wonderful looking at the, the look on the person's face 
when my counterpart would be like, no, 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 I'm not in charge, she is, right? And they'd be like, oh, right? It, the look on their face is just, it's, it's worth every, everything. Like, it's just so wonderful. Um, and, uh, and then once they actually have that respect for you, it's, it's fantastic and everything else is smooth sailing. Um, but yeah, definitely being a woman in a male dominated area is challenging. You will come to the point that is exa it's exhausting some days because you are, and I hate to say it, but you're constantly on high alert when it comes to being in a male dominated area. Oh, did they comment that way? Or, oh, are they looking at me this way? And I had, um, I had a counselor in high school and she gave me these words and I've lived by them my whole entire career. And those words were, do not take it, uh, do not take it personally unless they make it personal. Right, and so, and what I've always taken about that is, guys are gonna joke about women, guys are gonna make derogatory comments, they're gonna, they're gonna make um, humorous, out, humor out of so many different disgusting things. Before I hand it to Cassie, uh, to the Cass, sorry, so don't call me Cassie, um, that uh, as someone who studied employment, all kinds of careers, uh, this behavior among men is very much not uh, restricted to uh, skill trades and construction. No, it's everywhere. It's in, office bill it's in offices, yep. it's in law offices, it's in hospitals. Uh, you know, men certainly could go a lot further in improving the way that they behave among women. Well, and sometimes actually men, and, and it's not actually a woman thing, men treat other men like that. Like the harassment that goes across the board is insane. So. One of the biggest things is that women tend to, like, or society goes, oh, well, men pick on women a lot. Have you ever been, like, obviously you haven't, but I'm sure on our panel, have you ever been the person who had to go get the coffees? Like, when you first get in and the initiation stage is just crazy, and it's crazy across the board. They are mean when you first get in. But when you, when you get past that, when you earn their respect, it's amazing. Because I have brothers and I have and I have and I have fathers. I have probably a hundred dads in construction, and I have a hundred brothers. And every single one of them respects me, and every single one of them will bend over backwards to make sure that I'm okay. Right? If they see I'm struggling, they'll come and help me. Right? And and that's one of the things that I I really dislike about construction is if we're on a hoist dock waiting for the elevator, there'll be a man. Um, actively struggling to lift something and everybody will ignore him. I will be walking down with a bag full of garbage or a bucket full of water and every single man on that hoist dock is going to ask me if I need help, right? So that's one of the biggest things is, yes, it's a very big male dominated area, but once you actually earn that respect, those men bend over backwards for you. They become your family, right? So it's not necessarily a scary thing to be in a male-dominated area, so. And I can, I can admit uh, making the same mistake. I mentioned I interviewed more than 100 tradespeople. I went to a work site to interview a female electrician, and I asked the man on site if I could uh, speak with uh, his employee, and he said, no, that's my boss. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, her apprentice, yep. right? And I, I, you know, I had to, you know, uh, pick my head up from off the floor. I was wrong to make that assumption. Um, uh, Cass, let's change uh, a little bit. Can you say a bit about the uh, employment opportunities for someone who enters a uh, culinary field? You mentioned yeah. your job right yeah, away. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. Uh, does anybody in here uh, eat? <laughs> right, so y'all all have jobs. Uh, it, it's everywhere, food is everywhere. I have friends who are in, like I have friends who own restaurants, I own a catering company, I've been on TV, I've done competitions all across the country, my best friend works on private yachts in the Caribbean, she makes like $200,000 a year, like it's ridiculous, like, <laughs> it, yeah, it's crazy, like it's so wild, and like I went from 
being an executive chef at a restaurant to owning my own company to now I do primary research for agriculture development. Like, and it's all over the place. Like you can do anything. If you can think about something that is food oriented, culinary is there. It's always going to be there. The job opportunities are endless. I love it. How much again per year on the yacht? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, how about uh, over here, uh, Tanya, can you say something about uh, myths? You know, we all, I think we're correcting a lot of myths just by you all being on the stage and we're all seeing that uh, women can be successful in traditionally male-dominated fields. Uh, but is there anything else that maybe you believed about the skilled trades generally or your profession um, that, uh, or others believe that you'd like to correct the record? I guess I touched on it earlier, stating that you don't have to come with the with all this muscle or be a bodybuilder, be super strong to think that you're incapable to take on that job, because um, I can do it. And when you start, just like anybody else, it, sometimes we put a lot on ourselves just based on our gender, and it has nothing to do with that, because I've had other guys come into the shop who want to lift a tire, and they're struggling. <laughs> And it's just that you are now going to learn not only skills mentally, but your body is going to learn muscle memory, and you're going to be stronger than you ever thought you could be. And again, there are tools. We want to work smarter, not harder. We want to work safe, get home safe. So you have everything that's, um, that you can utilize. And again, procedures are ergonomic ways of how you do lifting, tools that lift things for you so you're not doing it. Um, to make it easy on you. So there shouldn't be anything that would make you hold back thinking that you're just not built that way. Um, I'm bigger than some of the men I work with. Some of them are short and very thin. It's not about your physique at all. It's just about your determination and your will and what you want to do. There is no ceiling. Um, all the opportunities are there and that you can do it. I mean, I can do it, you can do it. Yeah, I mean, you're so inspirational, Tanya. Uh, Celeste, how about yourself? Any myths that you'd like to correct? I feel like masonry is something that people really don't know about. I'm gonna say a lot of you guys don't know what masonry is, but the biggest myth that is like people are spreading is that masonry is a dying trade. So it's almost like impeding people from even coming into masonry, but I'm in heritage masonry. And so what I do is I work on old buildings and old buildings are always falling apart. You literally can walk downtown and be like, oh, that needs fixing. And you know who does it? It's gonna be me. I'm literally always gonna have a job. So it's not a dying trade. You just got to be smart about it. Very good. Very good. good to know. Uh, and what I love about what you do, too, is you, you, know, you allow future generations to appreciate things that were really old. And then you know, if, you, if you didn't do what you do, you know, it wouldn't be fun going through the distillery district, for example, right? Uh, Kate, how about you? Uh, any myths that you'd like to challenge? So conveniently, both the myths I was going to talk about, these ladies just mentioned. Um, I've heard a lot that the industrial trades are dying trades. You know, machinists, well, we have CNC machines, computer numerical control machines to cut everything the way a traditional machinist would on a, on a lathe or a milling machine to fabricate parts. I really do not believe that industrial trades such as millwright or machinist or welder, um, the fact that they are dying, that's absolutely not true, uh, to play into the, the opportunities or, you know, if these trades are dying, it doesn't make sense why there's job openings and why, uh, I'll give you an example. When I got my red seal, I did an experiment. I put my resume on LinkedIn. Within 24 hours, I had 27 recruiters reach out to me and ask for an interview tomorrow. And then this job that I'm in currently, I wanted to have this job by the time that I was uh, 30 or 40. This was like my dream job because I had the opportunity to meet these skilled trades people working within the power industry and operating and learning how to control the power grid. I wanted that job so badly. The year I got my red seal, the job was mine because there are opportunities. There's nothing dying about it. And as well to play into the physical demand, I want to make a point within the millwright trade. It's really interesting the amount of people that I've met who compliment me for being small, for small, like having small hands, for being nimble, because there is a huge dynamic of the trade. Again, working in thousands of an inch. A lot of men aren't interested in learning that. They don't want to do that. They just want to pull chain falls and and use sledgehammers. There's a dynamic of the the precision elements and being able to fit into tight spaces, being able to weld because your hands are small enough to fit into tight corners. Um, it's certainly not a myth that you have to be like big, that you have to be huge to participate in these trades. There is a place for 
smaller people, like in frame and, and inability with your hands, uh, and there will always be jobs that's never going to go away. Excellent. Jump in. I just wanted to say one thing in regards to the availability of trades. There is such a high demand of trades because people have been looking down on it as if it isn't something that requires so much skills. Like for me, as automotive, I have to know some sort of plumbing for the hydraulics. I have to know electronics and electricity. I have to know HVAC because everybody's vehicle has AC and heat and the like. There's so much that you have to learn, and because everyone was being steered away from it, right now you can just drive down certain streets of Toronto and you'll see billboards signing bonus of two thousand dollars, BMW signing bonus just for them to sign you on. You're automatically getting five thousand dollars in your pocket. There is not enough of us, as well as. Earlier speaking of that, it's only $400 to do a semester. You only have to do three different segments for your apprenticeship. On top of that, you get $1,000 grants given to you just for being a part of it. And I don't know if they're still doing it, but for women, you were getting $3,000 per year just for being a part of it. They're throwing money at you, literally. They're begging you to come into the trades. Um, you start from out of high school. Everybody's working at a fast food job, hoping, hoping. When you have your friends, you're making over $20 in your apprenticeship. School is paid for. You come out. I'm making nearly, I'm making over $50 an hour. Like, I'm making good money. The hours are constantly there. Pandemic, there wasn't a time where there wasn't any need for the job. Everybody's going to need to move. Everyone's going to need their buildings to be put together. Everyone is going to need tradespeople. So they're not a dying trade. If anything, right now, there's a drought, and they're looking for you guys to explore and to get involved. Excellent. Well said. There is a drought. Uh, want, we have a time for a few more questions, um, but we also want to open it to anyone in the audience who might have a question. Some, you know, not everyone on the stage might be available uh, to talk with individually, so make sure if you have a question, you ask it uh, now. So uh, I just want to start to close, start to wrap up by asking uh, Loveline, you know, and, and everyone else here. Actually, Cass, keep, it, keep the mic, keep the mic. Let's start with you, Cass. What advice uh, would you have for students whose parents um, might be uncertain about the skilled trades, and uh, what, what should those young people say to their parents? So, I guess from personal experience, my parents drove me really, really hard. They were like, okay, you're going to go to university. You're going to be a space doctor. Do, do it all. And I was like, okay, no. Um, I don't want that in my world. What I want is something that I can touch, that I can hold, that I can affect, that I can practically change. And now, I look at my life and I look what I do, and it's, it's a totally different universe. I still get to function within the boundaries of the scientific interests that I had. I still get to do all of the artistry that I love to do. My parents have no idea what I do because I'm way smarter than them now. <laughs> and it's, there's so much opportunity within the trades so much more than just being like, okay, here's your stamped university degree. I'm going to go to an oversaturated industry where I'm probably not going to get a job and it's still going to be entry level if I do get it and work my way up this ladder. If you go into trades like we've been talking about all night, it's, that's what it is. Like, like you're there, you're done. That's it. You got your job. Well done. And you can immediately just go for it and start building your way up, building your way up and no matter whether or not you're a super genius or you had every opportunity or you come from a very different walk of life or you're recent to the country, it's, they want you. They want this industry. They want everyone to be involved and all you need is the relentless drive to succeed and you will succeed in it. Well, beautifully put, thank you. Good advice for young people. To uh, how about you, um, Alex, we'll just pass the mic over. What advice would you give to someone whose parents may be uncertain about their decision to pursue a trade? Um, so, luckily my dad um, actually wanted me to go into trades. Um, we did uh, renovations on our house all the time. Um, but I do know a lot of people whose parents um, immigrated into Canada and they worked so hard so that their kids didn't have to work as hard as them. So they ended up going and, and pushing them to the college and university. Um, if you have a passion, I believe 
that you should go for it. Um, even if you end up on a very long path to that passion, um, lots of people end up in college and university and they drop out halfway through and go into trades or they, um, they graduate and then have thousands upon thousands of dollars in debt and then they end up in trades. So what ends up happening is that you end up there anyways. So yes, your family may not agree with it, um, but educate them, right? Like sometimes, yes, it's like hitting your head against a brick wall sometimes when it comes to family, when it comes to parents. Um, but try to educate them, right? Bring home pamphlets. Go on the internet and, and see what the, um, the wages are. Because so many people, and, and I know that we've all talked about money and it's not necessarily the only aspect in trades, um, but if you go on the website, it will actually tell you how much most trades uh, make on an average uh, career. And what will happen is that so, because what's, what happens is that so many people are like, oh, well, trades are dirty, trades are for stupid people, trades are, trades are hardworking, and, and the last chance, um, and it's not, it really should be one of the first choices that you make, um, especially if it's something that you really want to do, right? Because there's so many things, and even with all different types of trades, there's so many different aspects of it, right? Like building a building. I know hundreds of people in that setting that don't get dirty. They, their pencils or their drawings or, or their, their um, inspectors or health and safety. They, yes, they have the boots on. Yes, they have the hard hat. Yes, they're in construction, but they don't get dirty. They don't, they don't have to physically, uh, they're not manual labor, right? But they are a part of construction. There's so many different parts. Um, and, and parents always look at, oh, well, I don't want you to work hard. I worked hard so that you don't have to. And, and the thing is, is that yes, they're trying to protect you, but if it's something that you are passionate about, you're gonna be happier in the end, and you're probably gonna get there at the end anyways, but it's just gonna be a longer path. So if it's something that you really are interested in, do the, uh, educate yourself about it. S try the co-ops. Um, I know now you can, well, even before, you could do 13, I think you do 14 years of high school, like uh, year 14 and stuff. Um, there's there's pre-apprenticeships, all that sort of stuff. So, so even if you stay in high school a little bit longer, but get into those OYAPs and those, those co-ops and all of that, try the different things. Um, I know you can take co-op um, a, few, a few semesters from, I think, grade 11. Um, so try it out, right? Like, if, if you don't like it, then okay, maybe change it out, but, um, yeah? Um, I love this comment from, often from parents, too. They don't want to say, uh, I really worked hard, so you wouldn't have to work hard. Uh, if you think about it, the people that, everyone in this room actually really admires your heroes, whether it's a, an Olympian, a professional athlete, content creator, business person, they work hard. It's the one quality that we really actually respect in people, you know, and we, sh we should be emphasizing that. Elaine, what have you learned from your discussion with your parents? How would you advise uh, young people to talk with them? I think once your parents realize how happy you are and how hard it actually is to live in the GTA or how hard it is to live in Canada, like they'll realize it, you know what I mean? You can't, the amount of money that you can make and the lifestyle you could have for yourself working in a trade versus in a factory or at Tim Hortons, no hate, my mom drives a school bus, like you know what I mean? Like it doesn't measure up to the lifestyle you could have for yourself in a trade. and. Once they realize it and how much it's worth it, they'll be there for you. And like, you guys, I wish I could emphasize it to you. Like, let me say this in a way that you'll understand. Like, you guys like to get your nails done. You guys like to get your hair done, your lashes done. You guys like to get your eyebrows done, right? Like, I know. But you don't realize that every other girl around the block does eyelashes. She does nails. She does, you can't be one of those girls because you're not gonna make enough money for the life you want to live. And I say that to my sisters too, because I'm only 22 and I get it. Like I like, I want to get my nails done. I can't because I'm in a trade. But like your lashes, like every other girl around the block 
does lashes on her Instagram page, on her TikTok, okay? You're not gonna make, you're not gonna get enough clients because they'll lit there's so many girls out there that do it. So you guys, like, they're gonna keep on bringing their prices lower and lower and lower until you're not making anything. You know what I mean? That's not a competition because there's too many of them out there. How are you gonna make a life, you know? Like, there's trips out there. You guys want to go on trips, on vacations, with the girls to Mexico. You're not going to be able to afford it. Like, it's sad to say, you know? Like, houses are expensive. And, like, I wish I could get you guys to understand, but you'll understand yourself in, like, 10, 15 years, honestly. But it's a big deal. Like, the trades are giving it to you for free. And if you start now, like she said, she's making $50 an hour. How, what's minimum wage? 15. 15? Our start, we just had a strike. Our starting right now is $23. $23 to go and sweep with a broom. You're sweeping. Do you know how big of a deal that is? Do you, if you guys want to work at Tim Hortons and McDonald's for the rest of your life, that's good, you know? But for a little while, you want to make something for yourself. Who wants kids? Yeah, good luck affording them. Good luck affording them in Toronto. So I have to say, houses are one million, a million, million point two. You know what I mean? If you don't, if you don't want it, like, if you don't think about this now, I'm not trying to stress you guys out. Later on down the road, when you're 25, 26, you're going to see how, what it was really worth. Like, this talk right here, you guys are on your phones and stuff like that. I was you. Trust me. Good luck. Use your brains. Think hard. That's right. Cast you have something to add, or? Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. a round of applause there. Oh, thanks, guys. Uh, just briefly, Cass. Just quick, I want to throw in that. Um, in culinary industry, you get paid to travel the world to go cook for other people? Like, a lot of money. Like, I'm literally going to Japan for three weeks, like, at the end of April. I, like, I've been everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I'll put you in my backpack. <laughs> just, like, if you want to travel, if that's part of your world, all right, just last question. Um, Kate, I'm going to start with you. If you could give your former high school self one piece of advice, what would it be? These ladies beside me have some wonderful advice, so I'm not going to share their advice. They can share it. But I would say keep an open mind to the fact that your career is not going to be as linear as you believe. I definitely thought that when I was your age. So putting myself in your shoes, I thought, what do I want to do for the rest of my life until I retire and then I'm going to die? It's honestly not like that. Once you get out into industry, if you choose an apprenticeship, after college, you'll find a job. You'll figure out the paces of, of your career. You don't have to believe that you're picking this one trade or this one pathway for the rest of your life. Keep your mind open to opportunities. Stay positive. Everybody you meet, shake their hand, make a good impression, and you will be shocked at the opportunities that open up for you. Wow. So. Great, great. Thank you. Okay. All right. So last, no pressure, what advice do you have for your former self, for your former high school self? I feel like these guys will sum it up even better than me, so I'm just going to give a really quick one. It would be, yes, go into the trades, but if you can, also go into tech. Like, honestly, tech and the trades are one of the highest paid jobs right now. I have friends who are in tech who are making amazing money, and then I have my friends in the trades. We all are making such good money, so those are the two pathways I would suggest. Awesome, awesome. Okay, and last word to, uh, before we take any questions, uh, to Tanya. Yeah. What advice would you give? The advice I would take is that use high school as an opportunity to explore. You don't know the skills you have or the talents that you have until you actually go out there and give it a try. Um, There's a lot of courses I thought I was only going to do maths and sciences and your parents think it's so limited, right? Like, oh, lawyer, doctor. Like, there's so much more things that you won't know until you get out there. You're also not gonna know if you actually enjoy what you think you're gonna do. So jump into co-op programs. Get yourself out there and actually explore and meet people who are doing it, because then you don't have to waste the time going into a program, paying all this money to realize it's just not for me. Um, try as many things, if it's a trade course, tech course, everything, just to see what do I actually like. Maybe that course isn't what I want to do, but I just realize I'm really good with my hands. You never know. So I would just say use this time to explore when it's on the cost of the city, you know? Perfect way to sum it up. Uh, and yeah, 
You never know unless you try, and that's why we have the OEM uh, program. So uh, this is a little word cloud. I thought nice looks nice in terms of the uh, ten word summary there of how our, our tradesmen describe what they do. Does anyone have uh, a question they'd like to address to anyone on the stage? Yeah. Are there any courses you have to take in high school in order to get into the trades? Or ones maybe you might want to recommend? Graduate. <laughs> so yeah, graduate is definitely one of the things. Um, GEDs and, and high school uh, diplomas are definitely a thing. Um, but not really. Um, if you're going to take courses to get into the trades, I recommend Woodshop. Um, Math, yeah, you use math on a daily basis. It's ridiculous. English, because um, yeah, your the communication skills definitely get you into doors that um, that you wouldn't be able to get into if you can't articulate the words. There's so many times that people and homeowners come up to me and they go, "Oh my God, you're you're um, well now I can't have I don't have the words, but uh, um, that I, I can articulate what I actually need to uh, explain to them, right? In, in a sense of how they're going to understand it. Because if you go to a homeowner and you just talk gibberish to them, they're not gonna understand all of the logistics that you just said to them. Um, but if you're actually able to use words that they would understand um, and in phrases that are, are simple enough to explain the situation, right? Yeah, briefly, um, to add to what Alex just said, I, I would mention that I'm ac actually very shocked in Millwright specifically, because that's my area, um, how many different courses I actually have to use. So out of, in guidance, like out of, out of high school, they said, you know, you're gonna need to know physics and math and communication and English. Now I have to use PowerPoint, I use Excel, I ha have to understand how to interpret data, I need to know statistics. Um, I work with hydraulics, pneumatics, every, every area of, of power, I would say take the tech classes if you're interested in trades, enroll in tech because this is an opportunity to try it out before you do it professionally, but also keep an open mind. There's a lot of stuff that I blew off in high school and said I'm never going to need to know that and now I use English or communication, um, that's like 90% of my job is communicating effectively. So keep an open mind, make sure you're actually taking home what you, what you learn in class. Awesome answer. Anyone else? Thanks Kate. Anyone else have a question? I was curious. Can I throw a quick comment out there about uh, yeah. pre prerequisites? Um, you don't need it, but it's extremely helpful if you can get some public speaking experience, in, in my industry at least. Um, a cool, cool thing about Jeff's is I probably don't need this. The, you'd hear me outside. Like the amount of projection that you learn in a kitchen because it's loud, it's so loud, and you gotta hear your voice as far as possible and as clear as possible because you work in milliseconds. And if you make a mistake in a millisecond, it sets you back and it stacks up and then everything falls apart and it's a disaster. Uh, so if you can get good at public speaking and general communication and learn that just because you're a girl doesn't mean you need to be quiet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Good. Good. Uh, question or uh, update from, yeah? Great. So uh, maybe a, a few short answers as we uh, got one. We have an opportunity for people to win a prize after this. Okay. So uh, lovely. So I actually had a lot of help with the OYAP program and co-op teachers. They helped me join the union while I was in high school. So when you join the union, I'm part of Local 27, they actually have a list. So if you finding an employer earlier while you're in high school, your teacher will find you 
a placement in co-op, right? If they like you in that co-op, and if you want to pursue that, most times after you graduate, they will hire you. You're not allowed to earn money while you're in high school. Sorry, guys, not possible. But when you graduate, they will hire you because they've already taught you everything you need to know, and they'll pay you. That happens with a lot of people. So now, say that they don't hire you and you're on the union, right? I don't know about non-unionized people. That's when you have to find your own job. When you're on the union, like Local 27, there's a list. It's called the out-of-work list. And that list, I was on that list for five days. No, not even, maybe two. Job. Because when an employer wants, like, they'll like call. There's like terms before Red Seal. There's first term, second term, third term, fourth term. The higher the term, the more experience you have doing something and the more you cost. So an employer will cost, hey, I need four term ones. They'll look at the list, whoever's on the list, gets shipped out. That's how fast jobs are. And you know how they're talking about, sorry, this is a little long. You know how they're talking about how it's a dying trade? The only reason it's a dying trade is because no one's going into the trades. And we just had a strike. The reason trades pay so high is because no one's going into it. So it's hard to find people to do that job. That's why you will get paid more. And that out of work list will get you shipped out to jobs no problem. You, that's union. And, and thanks for you know giving the shout out to OYAP as as an excellent starting point. Anyone want to Co-op. Co-op is the perfect way for you to get your leg in. Um, you're there to learn, and they don't expect you to know a lot because you are just getting your first steps in there. But showing your determination, your eagerness to learn, that you have interest, is a great way for them to look for you p after your school semester is over to possibly think of you as um, hiring you on. And that's how I got my foot into the door with automotive because I was there ready to learn and they saw that I was eager. Uh, that that co-op position turned into a job and then my employer was willing to sign me on as an apprentice. And it wasn't based on anything that I had taken in school. You do need your high school diploma, but it's your willingness to actually work because they want to know that if they're going to take the time on to hire you and if they're going to give some of their manpower to, to mentor you, that you're a sponge, you're ready to soak it up and you're ready to apply yourself. Because again, it's not a lot of us there, so they're looking to get their workforce up and running. Everyone, please join me in a huge thanks to Tanya, Celeste, Kate, Lovely, Alexandra, and Pat. Lovely. Um, please stay where you are, uh, panelists and everyone else. Uh, before I ask Ta uh, Ms. Maeda to say a few uh, wrap-up words, uh, we'd love to give you an opportunity to win one of three $100 gift cards to Marks. Marks. And, uh, want, you know, there's an entire group that left. So you're on, you're, you, uh, your odds are better, right? So if you uh, complete this, you can scan that. It'll take you to questions. You have just five questions to answer. And uh, if you want to be put into a draw for a gift card, just put your email. Everybody, just as you're wrapping up, I'm going to ask for your attention just for the last few minutes because the bell's going to go. 
I wanted to say thank you for being such great participants today. I know it was a very long morning and a long day, and we got a ton of great information, but you guys really were engaged and listening, and I appreciate that. I know it can be hard without those breaks in between class to check in and out. I wanted to also say thank you so much to our panelists, our experts, our, our trade people, so if you can help me give them a round of applause and say thank you very much. We sort of heard it over and over again today, time is money, and they took time out of their day to be here with us and to share their story, to maybe inspire us and you on your journey, so thank you. Thank you to John, who took time to work with our panelists and help coordinate the event today, which we are eternally grateful for our <laughs> partnership. And thank you to Mr. DeSantis, Mr. Samaria and his team who came to record it, and everybody else that was involved here today, and your teachers for registering you and for getting you here today. So thank you, thank you, thank you from OYAP at TCDSB, Experiential Learning, from Job Talks. Um, thank you for being here. Everyone, please join me in thanking this uh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you.